My name is Jackie Feliciano. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. Uh, what that means for me is I have not used a mood or mind-altering substance since May 22nd of 2013. Uh, first off, welcome to the 2019 Oxford House World Convention. Um, please turn off all your cell phones during the breakout session. Uh, just as a reminder, if you're smoking or vaping, please use the alleyway behind the hotel. You cannot use the Starbucks exit to get to the alley. So do not smoke by the doors or in the covered valet parking areas and there is no vaping allowed in the hotel. Please make sure that you speak clearly into the microphone because this session is being recorded. Um, if you're using the Oxford House Convention app, please remember to rate your sessions as you attend. So you guys are attending the first breakout session, which is leadership versus bossism, practicing democracy. The traditional halfway house that led to the formation of Oxford House was beset by an adversarial we versus them culture that often pitted the residents against the authority figures in the house. The we versus them culture detracts from the culture of recovery. Early on, Oxford House recognized that an, that an egalitarian democratic culture could alleviate the we versus them culture and keep the focus on the achievement of, of comfortable recovery. In many states, houses, chapters, and state associations all work together, recognizing the different roles of each. Sometimes, however, there is bureaucratic overreach, and this should be avoided. One of the biggest challenges is fostering democracy in houses and in chapters. The system is purposely rigged to foster democracy by its emphasis on house meetings, election of officers, the equal share of expenses, and the autonomy of each individual Oxford House. It's important in all houses and chapters to ensure that everyone is treated equally. By establishing term limits of, on house officers, everyone has the chance to rise to the occasion, accept responsibility, learn leadership, and strengthen sobriety. It's also important for Oxford House outreach workers to serve as resource persons for residents teaching them how the Oxford House system works, but like Tom Sawyer, challenging residents to do the work themselves. Since membership in a chapter or state association is always voluntary, emphasizing fellowship over enforcement and education over authoritarianism is necessary and builds membership. While housing service committees play an important educational role, Members need to remember that their role is to act as helpers, not enforcers or bullies. Chapters and state associations have an important role to play in supporting individual Oxford houses and their residents, but at all times, they need to recognize the autonomy of each individual Oxford house. The panel will discuss what Oxford houses, chapters, and state associations can do to build constructive relationships with, the, uh, with each other. So we have five panelists today. Um, and our first panelist that's gonna come up is Tim Marini, who is an Oxford House resident in North Carolina. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Timothy. I am a Oxford House alum from the state of North Carolina. Um, is everyone having fun? Yeah. Awesome. So I want to take an opportunity to thank um, my peers and everyone here for allowing me to share some of my experience with leadership versus bossism and more importantly how it associates um, with the state associations and the regional associations and at that, that level. So again, I currently am afforded the opportunity to serve as the North Carolina State Chair um, and uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity. I've been able to spend 16 months in an Oxford house, moved out uh, approximately last December. Um, I am a person in long-term recovery, and again, what that means for me is I haven't find, found a need to use minor mood-altering substances since August 2017. Come on. Um, so 
as far as the state level, um, you know, we're taught often here, we're suggested often to look at it almost like it's flipped upside down. So it goes houses, chapters, state associations, world council, and then it would be the employees of the 501c organization of Oxford House, right? So we, we get to do but serve for the people um, in the houses in that area. Um, and by focusing on teamwork and collaboration, um, we get to reap some of the benefits as residents and uh, individuals associated with the Oxford House. What I, what I can tell you is being part of that team and learning from my peers, the men and the women with, within the state association, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen by not listening, by not being open-minded, by not being willing to take suggestions, just like our programs in recovery do, right? We have to be honest, open-minded, and willing. So for collaboration and teamwork to take place and focus on the leadership aspect and not telling people what to do but making suggestions and being open-minded to take suggestions really is uh, what I believe we do really well in the state of North Carolina and Oxford House as a whole. We're able to take suggestions and implement them for the benefit of growth so we can continue to allow uh, future men and women to reap the same benefits that we either currently or have had the opportunity to do. Um, I guess I'm not going to take a lot of time. Uh, you guys have a lot of individuals up here that are going to be able to really uh, um, provide you with a lot of great insight. What, what I want to uh, just end on and, and focus on is um, we've talked a lot about blueprints for success. And, um, and really all of that takes place by uplifting individuals and understanding the, bi the bigger purpose and the why. Um, what I've been taught through Oxford House um, and I've been able to learn from men and women and my peers is that um, a leader isn't someone who is going to um, focus on their benefit. They're worried about the bigger picture and understanding and asking questions, focused on how we can create a better uh, community, not only within Oxford House, but within our families, within our employers. Um, Oxford House and the leadership that was taught to me is what allows me to be the individual that I am today, whether it be in a recovery setting or outside of that. Um, those things um, aren't taken lightly. They're greatly appreciated. And, and my hope for everyone in this room that you are able to take this opportunity back to your houses be the leader that we're talking about here. Instead of going back to the houses um, and, and letting them know the things that uh, weren't okay with this or you would have wanted different, empower them. Take this information and, and um, create future leaders, not only within Oxford House, but again, in, those, in the outside community too for your family. Uh, I couldn't think of a better organization that allows personal growth to take place than Oxford House. Um, it starts at the house, it goes then into a chapter level, then at a state level, and will continue on to, as was talked about earlier by Kathleen, the, the consistent growth that takes place. If you want to work for Oxford House, um, let your actions show that you want to be a leader and let your ears learn from those that are currently are based on their actions and what they learn from the people around them. Um, again, I just encourage all of you to really cherish this moment, these things. I don't believe that's an accident that all of us are in this room. Um, and I think that it's, for me personally, it's my responsibility to empower other men and women to find a new way of life and try to become leaders. Thank you for your time. You. Okay, our second panelist um, that is gonna come up is Mr. Dave Horstman, yeah. <laughs> Oxford House alumnus for Texas and World Council member. Yeah, boy. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Dave Horstman. I'm a grateful recovering addict and alcoholic, and my clean date is January 9th of 2015, and for that, I'm truly grateful. 
I uh, moved into Oxford back in January of 2015, and I had the opportunity to be in Oxford House for three and a half years um, before becoming an alumni and got to live in three different houses in different cities throughout the state of Texas. And, I, and through that experience, I learned a lot about a bunch of different areas and really what this whole thing is about instead of just one localized area. And that was a true blessing for me that really skyrocketed me to continue and in getting into leadership roles and uh, giving back to this organization that saved my life. Um, today I'm spe specifically going to talk about um, empowerment and building leaders because a true leader in my eyes is not somebody who just leads but they're ones who are also building the next set of leaders that are going to continue to uh, replicate in this model. Um, so that's really important to me. Um, first off, you know, leadership it starts in the house. Um, it starts with the newcomer. It starts with being on the same level with your roommates. I got a couple quotes here. Um, to lead people, walk beside them. As for the best leaders, the people do not notice their existence. When the best leader's work is done, the people say, we did it ourselves. That's putting ourselves on the same level as our housemates. You know, that's, that's when you're in the house meeting, you are not running the show. You're the last one to vote. You're the one empowering the newcomers to use their voice and get them to speak first. Um, you're the mediator. You're the voice of reason and bringing logic back into the conversation and bringing the peace and having ha healthy and ha happy discussions. Um, it's not about telling what people what to do. We don't have bosses in Oxford House. We have leaders. And I know for me personally, I came to Oxford House for that reason. I, you know, I'd relapsed and I'm, I was a chronic relapser. I went in and out for so many years. Um, so many different sober living homes and Oxford was different for me because I was not just like it was said in the very beginning opening things. I wasn't just being told what to do. I wasn't just a number. I had a voice in my house. Um, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. Um, when we get these newcomers right in the door, like that's one thing I always focus on is, is working with the newcomer, building them up. Um, any experience I've had in a strong house, when I've moved from that house and moved on to whatever ne the next part of my journey is, it's amazing to me and one of the coolest things I get to look back on is watching that person that came in fresh off the street that a lot of people didn't think was going to make it and taking those extra five or ten minutes with that person each day to sit down and talk with them and, and you know, really give them hope and point them in the right direction, watching them become the next leader in, their, in the house and be the one who is doing the, those same things and sitting back and guiding and teaching. Um, and then, you know, as we grow in Oxford House, um, and one of the biggest things is, rep, part, you know, part of our model is replication. You know, if we don't give and share what we've learned along the way, you know, we're, we're being selfish and keeping that ourselves. It's, it's, it's all spiritual principles of a, of a, you know, of a recovery program. Um, leadership consists of nothing more but taking responsibility for everything that goes wrong and giving others credit for everything that goes well. This really comes into play when we start getting involved in the chapter level um, at regional and state associations. Um, in the role of a chair. Um, you have a team beside you, right? And, and in order to have a proper team, you have to empower your team. Um, and they, everybody needs to feel like what they're doing is right and, and, and what they're doing is well. And, you know, I, I'm sure how many people in here have heard or have held a leadership position in a chapter? Okay, look at this. Amazing, right? So in those positions... Do you guys do all the work or do you delegate and, uh, and, and work as a team to get things done? Yeah. So this is, this is really key and really important because if we do all the work for them, what happens when we leave? Everything falls apart, you know. So um, the greatest leader is not necessarily the one that does the greatest things. He's the one that gets the people to do the greatest things. You know, uh, when it comes to when it comes to chapters and associations, it's really important that that we are you know we're we're passing that on and passing that torch. Um, you know, it, it's it's all about being humble and empowering the next person, and and replication is huge for me and it's a huge part of leadership. 
I mean, the future of Oxford House and the future of what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years lays with what happens right now in this time period where we're all in these roles and in these positions. Um, the people that are going to be the next leaders of Oxford House are not in this room. They probably aren't even in the rooms of recovery yet. They're probably not in our houses yet, but they will be. There could be somebody that comes in the next couple of weeks and moves into our houses, and they're going to be the people that we need to help train and guide to be the next leaders of Oxford House. So, thank you. You know, one of the key things um, I will tell you as a, a person who had a problem with authority, I don't know if you guys can relate to that, uh, prior to coming into Oxford House, one of, the, one of the things that was very enticing about it was the fact that my voice mattered. Um, because for so long, I knew how to use it in a really negative way. So now I was going to learn how to use it for something positive. And, uh, and that was huge. I, I didn't do really well with people telling me what to do. Still don't. Um, but I do really well working with a team of people to accomplish something, to you know, achieve a goal. Um, and I feel like that's a lot of us that do that. So. Um, I'm going to lead into our third panelist, um, Aaron Vick, who is Oxford House alumnus and outreach in Oklahoma. Good morning, y'all. Um, my name is Aaron Vick. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I've been have not used a mind-altering substance since November 10, 2016. What? One of my favorite quotes uh, is in that 60 Minutes video, I'm sure most of y'all have seen it, uh, by Paul Malloy. Um, it's a very simple quote. He says, uh, I think this, this is where we stumbled into a very good system, you know. And this topic is a very, very important part of that system. Um, democracy and leadership encourage people to take responsibility and ownership over their situation, not just in their houses, but in their own lives, um, in the lives of others. And that's not stuff that we've ever done as addicts and alcoholics. You know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I've been told my whole life what to do. You need to do this, this, this. But nobody's ever just said, here, I'll show you what to do, you know, and pulled me to a meeting. Um, and that changed everything. And, and it was those people that I lived with when I first moved into Oxford House, you know, those leaders that were like, come on, we're going to show you the way, you know. So as you guys are living in houses, just be very mindful of, of what you guys are replicating to, to your new members, you know. Every, every action, every behavior that you make, you're, that's what they're going to replicate that. They're going to, you know go by what you're doing so just keep that in mind are you replicating a program of recovery are you replicating you know responsive being a responsible member of the community you know are you repl replicating you know being a leader you know you, leaders are, are are bred not not born in my opinion you know I, I didn't come into oxford being a leader you know i was rep that was what, what was replicated to me so thank y'all So raise your hand again if you've been a member of Chapter. Wow, wow. that's really, really cool. Um, I ask that simply because I was trying, I was thinking about my experience first coming into uh, Oxford House and what that looked like. And I remember going to a chapter, my first chapter meeting, <laughs> and someone said to me, we have nominations today. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and, you know, they, they needed a chair. And uh, before I took my second breath, there was a motion, there was a second, there was a vote. And they're like, congratulations, you're the chapter chair. And I was like, what just happened? Um, I have no idea. But, you know, sometimes my experience is that we have to be thrown into these things because 
for so long we live life based off of fear. Yeah. Um, and so even as a child, I was thrown in the pool to learn how to swim. And so it was kind of the same thing. And uh, what comes with that, though, is having people who were willing to show me how to do stuff. Um, I think that that was really important. Uh, when you talk about the concept of bossism versus leadership um, is that it's a kind of walk the walk, talk the talk situation. Um, it's never a situation in which you point the finger and you do. Uh, again, don't do well with authority. Don't point your finger at me. But I do well if you're willing to sit down and take the time to show me. Um, I, I don't like the word senior uh, residents. That's not a term that I'm comfortable with. I like seasoned, like the guy that goes like this with the salt on the steaks. Uh, and so I always tell seasoned members that when a member first moves into a house, the more time you take in the beginning, the better outcome you're going to have. Um, you spend that extra 10, 15 minutes with them, letting them know how to answer the phone, what the Wi-Fi password is taking them to their 12-step meeting, introducing them to people that could potentially be a sponsor, um, all those things that as we stick around here for a long time, a little while, uh, we get so wrapped up in our own personal lives that we forget sometimes. Um, and we have to remember to take that. Someone took that time for us, and we have to take it for the next person. Uh, so with that, I'm going to give you Michelle Williams. She is Oxford House alumna and outreach in Colorado. Raffle. <laughs> raffle. It's not a raffle here, though. Hey, everybody. I'm Michelle, and I'm an alcoholic. I like to introduce myself old school, you know, like in the rooms. But also what that means is I haven't had a drink or a drug since September 13th, 2015. Thank you. I'm really grateful to be here, and I'm really gr glad everybody here got to make it. You know, not everybody who thought they were going to is sitting here right now. So, you know, say a little prayer for the people that didn't get to make it to this room. Um, you know, when I moved into Oxford, uh, some girls voted me in, and I thought it was pretty crazy because, you know, we, women don't like women. And I thought, wow, this is different. So I moved into a house, and I realized very quickly that I was an equal, which I have never been, or at least I told myself I had never been. I was always the black sheep. And when I moved into my house, I saw some girls working together, um, supporting one another, and I was really on a high energy with that. Shortly after I moved in, some of you may have experience with this, there was a lot of turnover. I never got the leadership um, or the guidance. Uh, I had to learn the positions myself and kind of take the reins, you know? And I realized that that um, uncomfortability which was forced growth, which I'm grateful for, but at uncomfortability, I didn't want to put another woman through. So when another woman came into the house, I decided to show her rather than throw her under the bus. And, you know, I began to rebuild a house. And then I was uh, voluntold at a chapter meeting <laughs> to be the chapter treasurer. And, uh, you know, that was really beneficial for me. Of course, my ego thought I was better, but also I felt a part of. And uh, so I had, to, I had to find this balance. Um, and then from the chapter treasure, you know, I would go to state and just get this wealth of knowledge. And, and then I got to come to world like you guys, and I was just on fire. And I was really grateful for Oxford. And then I was given a position as outreach. and. You know, um, I am so grateful for Oxford House and to be able to stand here and, and speak in front of all you guys. And thank you all for coming. This room is quite packed. So um, one thing, uh, you know, I've learned quite a few things as a leader. I like to think of myself as a leader, at least. Uh, you know, 
my, my sponsors always told, well, I, let me get back to that. You know, I, I, as an addict and alcoholic, I wanted to control it all because nobody can do it as good as me. And I'm sure there may be a few people who have had chapter positions that think I have to do it all. One thing my sponsors told me is I've taken on so much in my, you know, uh, almost four years of sobriety is that I need to remain replaceable, open-minded and willing. If I remain replaceable, I am guiding the next person to take my position so I can grow further. And if I remain replaceable, I am have more hands on deck to help me. Um, when you're in a chapter position or a chair or an HSC and you have houses failing, you don't have to be the only one going into every single house every week to try to solve all their problems. Not only is it beneficial to you to have more hands on deck to relieve some of the pressure from yourself, but you get more people involved, more addicts, more alcoholics, you are helping more people feel useful and whole. And I know when I came into the house, once I had usefulness and wholeness, I felt like I belonged. Like I didn't need to go out and drink to numb anything. I felt useful, like other people needed me. So get people involved and show them the ropes and relieve some of the pressure off yourself. Um, another thing that I, uh, I, I my sponsor has coached me, let me, let me give the credit where credit's due, uh, is to acknowledge my faults. I know uh, people who've guided me can acknowledge and apologize when they are wrong. And I know that I've made mistakes and I like to, I don't like to apologize, but when, when things happen, I like to show other people that you can apologize and that I'm only human. I can be wrong, and I can try to be a boss and tell people what to do, and then my chapter members level me and let me know I am not the boss, and then I can apologize. You know, so um, my, my biggest point is when you get into a position where you're able to help somebody, check your ego at the door, and remember that if you're guiding somebody else, you are building them up. Because we see in them what they don't see in themselves. And so we can be, be very useful as a team. And that's all I have. Thank you, Michelle. I felt, I felt empowering. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was thinking, of, when she was talking, I was thinking about one of the things that I do as an outreach worker in my area um, is, you know, we talk about this Tom Sawyer effect and uh, as outreach we talk about window time. And what that means for me is if you're brand new, I ask you to get in the car and then I don't let you out of the car. <laughs> Uh, because I want to teach you um, and what comes with teaching is learning about you too um, it's taking the time to get to know you to learn what your strengths are um, so that we can utilize what you have to become an asset to what we are um, and so if I find out you're really good with finances I know exactly what I'm doing with you <laughs> If I find out that you're really good at uh, taking notes and you're very meticulous, I know what I'm doing with you. If I find out you have OCD and you're a cleaning freak, I know what I'm doing with you. Um, and, it's, and it's taking those things and, and utilizing those within the area. It's always a situation when I'm asked, one of the things I learned very early on uh, with myself and others is People sometimes in the houses want, just, they just want the answer. Just tell me what to do. That's not Oxford House. <laughs> um, so my question is always, well, what do you think we should do? How would you handle that? And then some get mad because <laughs> they just want to be told what to do. And what I've learned that 
Again, that comes from fear. Um, the fear of making a decision and standing behind it. Um, and so I urge you, uh, when you go back to your areas, uh, to challenge those who are afraid to make decisions that are in the best interest uh, of their, their houses and chapters and areas um, to, to learn how to stand up and take responsibility for those things. Uh, with that, let me give you uh, one of my favorite people on this planet. Um, Mr. Sean Wister. He is an Oxford House alumnus in Outreach in Delaware. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name's Sean. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'll keep it on the business side. Uh, for me, I haven't, I ain't got high since July 27, 2011. Um, and a couple of things like that, I, you know, I know for me, I know a lot of people sometimes say like my best thinking got me here. I don't know about any of you, but like my best thinking never told me to call Oxford House, yeah. right? My best thinking never said go to rehab. My best thinking never said don't get high today, right? Like, and you know, for me, when I moved into Oxford House and so I got clean in 2011. I moved into Oxford House in 2012 after being in treatment. I didn't want to go for 30 days. I ended up living there for 15 months. Uh, that was weird, right? Um, and I moved into my first Oxford House in, in Wilmington, Delaware, and I'm originally from New Jersey where there's a ton of houses and I had no clue. One is literally like a quarter of a mile from my grandmom's where I was living and getting high every day. Um, and I moved in this house and, and like me and these guys, um, you know, they interviewed me and I'm like, why are you asking me all these questions? Uh, you know, can I, can I pay you some money to live here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go back home. And, um, you know, I got accepted into the house. I had more clean time than everybody in the house, right? But like, it didn't matter, right? Because I didn't know anything about Oxford House. And I was the new guy, so the chapter meeting was the next week. Oh, you're new, you gotta go to the chapter meeting, right? <laughs> and somehow I've been at every chapter meeting since. Uh, it, it, all over where I've lived. And um, at that first chapter meeting, uh, we had, I think we had like 10 houses in the chapter and maybe, we were lucky if three showed up to chapter. Uh, and of course I ended up somehow being the chapter chair. I didn't know what that was, uh, but like, we'll figure it out. Uh, I don't even think the outreach worker came to chapter meetings at the time. And um, so I found the manuals, I started reading the manuals and, and like learning for myself, right? Cause that's, I need to figure this out. Um, and I can say, I've read about three books in my entire life. I have a college degree and I've read the basic text, the Oxford House manual, <laughs> and the chapter manual, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, but, so like one of the things that I like I would talk about is, right, uh, in the 12-step in the fellowship, we have concepts, right? And, and the fourth concept of the fellowship is about leadership. And it talks, it, it says that leadership qualities should be carefully considered when selected trusted servants. How many people have lived in a house where like the house president ran and bragged to like people so he could get Boo Boo to come over later, right? <laughs> Nobody? Really? Don't be shy, <laughs> right? Cause like, listen, that happens, right? Some of us feel like, oh, I'm the president of my Oxford house. I got some power. Like, nah, bro, sit down. No, you don't, right? <laughs> like, you're going to chair this meeting. Let's keep it on track, right? So we're not sitting here for four hours, you know, uh, because, like, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, when it comes to that, like, we are no better, right? You know, I lived in Oxford house for six and a half years. When I had a guy with moved in with four days clean, one day clean, you know, 
One of the big things, oh, he can't pay as a drug test. He can't move in. Why not? Right? Um, and uh, they move in. And, and honestly, I would sit back in house meetings and keep my mouth quiet. Because sometimes when an outreach worker lives there, everybody thinks they're going to do everything for you. Uh, that's not happening with me. Right? I might print your paperwork just so we're not using loose leaf paper that week. But, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's about sitting there and letting, you know, f making sure that new people understand that, like, your voice needs to be heard in here, right? You bring something to the table here, right? Uh, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, I'm a very big fellowship person. Uh, I believe in, in the fellowship. And uh, honestly, when, when a house is surrounded and full of people that are working recovery programs, I don't think you end up with bossism issues, right? Because we all understand that, like, we're all equal, right? Universal fellowships we belong to, right? And um, we're no different. I don't care if you're a doctor or a lawyer. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care how many times you've been to jail. It doesn't matter. Um, I don't care if, if you've never been homeless. Like, you know, that wasn't my story. But, you know, it is for some. We all deserve a chance. I called an Oxford house to get in. And like, honestly, I've never forgotten the fact that I'm the one that called the Oxford house. They didn't call me, yeah. right? There's plenty of people out there looking for residents, right? And uh, are looking to become residents, I'm sorry. And like, if, if you gotta go do a presentation, go do a presentation, right? Get in the treatment centers, build the relationships with the recovery community, right? <laughs> I don't know how many times I can sit outside of a meeting, talk to people, and like next thing you know, they're moving into Oxford houses, right? Um, and like being, you know, there's times where, you know, I have, I have a resident sitting in this room right now, and like uh, the other day told me I was soft as cotton. She, she used a different word, but I, it's not appropriate on a microphone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because like I could get a phone call right? And it's something going on in a house and like I'm very upset, right? Because there's no need that it needs to be going on. And like in my mind on the way to the house, everybody's out, right? <laughs> Everybody, you're all on contract, you know? And like by the time I get there, I sit, I listen to every side of the story because we all know there's three, right? Yours, mine, and like we're going to listen for another one. And like, nothing happens by the end of it. We're ha we had a good meeting, might have taken a little while, um, but like at the, end of, at the end of the meeting, like we got some issues resolved, right? The residents were able to talk it out without me saying you're on contract, you know? Because I don't want to do that, you know? And, and like a lot of times we also get it mixed up. Like when our roommates are putting us on contract, it ain't a bad thing, right? It's because they care about you. I'm not the person, if you don't want to be held accountable, don't interview at a house that I live in, right? Because you leave a spoon in the sink, that's $10. Right? You cook dinner, you better clean, because that's, that's a hefty sink. You know, and like, I firmly believe in that. You know, you need to clean up after yourself. My mom didn't live there. She didn't clean up after me anyway, right? You know, and, um, you know, so, like, there are times where, like, I have to be, you know, we all have that person in the house that's the, the, the tough one, right, that everybody hates. Um, but, like, listen, at the end of the day, you can call me, right, when you get to your ninth step and you worked out your resentments and you need to make an amends to somebody <laughs> because, like, you're still clean. Right? Because like we're the ones that care about you. Right? We're the ones that actually care, the ones that hold you accountable. You know, and like that is the blessing. And like for me with Oxford House, it all goes back to that first house that I lived in. That's where I learned, don't you leave a dish in the sink. We had a dishwasher and I wouldn't even use that. I was afraid. Right? <laughs> but, you know, it was a six person house and like, uh, Five of us have all been clean since 2011. We are all, <clears throat> you 
We are all still very good friends. Our pathways have changed. Some of us have moved on, but what we do is at Christmas time, we try to get together with all of us when everybody's in town, have breakfast, and like the table went from five to, I don't know, about 16 because of people's significant others, kids. Like those guys are family to me. If you ever, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you one funny story about these guys in this house because I love these guys like my brothers. My roommate's son walked in the house one night and five grown men sitting on our nice leather furniture that we had, watching Pitch Perfect, <laughs> <laughs> singing along to the movie, right? And his son walked in and looked at us like we were crazy. <laughs> but honest to God, I can sit here and tell you that's one of my favorite movies now, <laughs> right? No shame behind that either. I know there's some other people out there that like it, right? <laughs> and there's no shame in that, man. Like, I learned how to live and have a good life living in an Oxford house. I learned how to laugh with people, you know, sitting up on the porch till 4 o'clock in the morning, smoking cigarettes, can't breathe the next morning, <laughs> you know. And, like, those guys helped teach me, like, how to be a human being, right? and do the things like because now we all do the things that we, like we've always supposed to been doing right how many people in here like just moved into an oxford house 30 days ago so and the reason i ask that is like i want you all to know you are the most important people here right grab on to people ask questions because, like, you might be that person in your house that feels like, I can't say nothing, right? The senior, per this seasoned senior, however you want to call it, <laughs> took four overnights and they're only supposed to have three and, like, you're scared to say something, right? Say something, right? Because if you allow them to continue doing that, you got to do it for the next person and the next person and the next person. And the next thing you know, the person's locked in their bedroom and you can't find them. Right? Because we continued to co-sign their BS. We're not in the business to co-sign people's stuff. If you don't like it, there's a t-shirt down in that t-shirt room that says change your attitude or your address. Right? So... Um, so I want to thank you all for being here. If this is your first convention, welcome. Like, you're going to have a great time. Don't be intimidated. Um, you know, but please ask questions. So we're now into the question portion. So read, you, you can go to the microphone and read your question. Uh, and then we're going to read it again afterwards anyway because we're being recorded. And thank you, guys. So we actually do have um, some time for questions. If anybody has uh, anything that they want to say or need some clarification on or maybe are presented with a dilemma um, or just need clarification on something that you wanted to hear about. Yes. My name's Esty, I'm an alcoholic. Yes. Hey. Right, so um, part of the reason why I took this class is I was hoping that we have a common dilemma. I find several times a lot of questions is uh, we have two people that have been there forever in a house that um, take over the meetings, take over the positions, and uh, a lot of people say they feel that they're being bossed into everything that, the, that everything they say is shut down. I just want to know if you guys have found a solution to breaking that up in some way, besides sitting into every house meeting they have for months, and then when you walk away a month later, they're calling you back. So his his question for anyone who didn't yeah. <laughs> who didn't hear that one uh, is uh, having members in a house, uh, one or two members in a house who seem to have taken the bossism approach um, and ways to address that. 
So Sean, who, by the way, just a side note, uh, the t-shirts that he's talking about are from his state. <laughs> They're from my, wait, they're state. from our, our state. home state. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I never lived in an Oxford house in New Jersey, so I can't take credit for them. Um, so these two people live in your house? Well, no, I've, I've, as a chapter chair, I've had to be to a couple of houses now that, that this is the story, and I get that story and. Okay, so ideally, if they're two of the longest running members in the house, ideally they have zero house position, right? right. right? They, sh they should have taught the books to the newer people, right? Yeah. You know, you got two guys in a 10 person house, they've been there for eight years, there's no reason they're still doing books, <laughs> right? Um, so maybe, I, you know, I don't know how your chapter would work, but maybe your chapter could implement something like that, right? Maybe a chapter bylaw where, like, we need to start making the senior seasoned members, not house officers, uh, after so long. I, I've lived with some Woo! people like that. So. I have a couple right now, too. He's not here. So, so one of the things that I, I always do when I go into a house and, and we have that situation going on, there's, there's newcomers, there's other people in the house that really have the opinion. They obviously called you, right? Yes. So that there's obviously somebody in that house who's willing to speak out. Um, the problem is a lot of times people don't have the confidence in themselves yet to speak and address those people themselves. Correct. So what I, the approach I always like to do is I, I like to go into a house meeting and I like to put it out there and say, hey, this is something that's been addressed to the chapter. This is something that obviously is going on and bring it up and see how they react. And, uh, and one of the situations I like to do is like, for example, let's say you have somebody who doesn't show up to house meetings regularly, right? Or you have somebody who's always late or this and that. Um, Call it manipulative, call it what you want, but what I always do is with the other guys, I say, how is this fair to you guys as a house? That this person is not here and never shows up to this house meeting, but you guys are here. You guys always show up. All of a sudden, the residents of the house are going, yeah, I am here, why aren't they? Right, and, and it starts to like build this fuel and this fire inside of the residents of the house to take back that, that control or use their voice and feel empowered with it. And I've, I've noticed with that approach um, that it, it does tend to help a lot. And, and you know, um, one of the other things is, and I'm not afraid to say it, I've had other people say, man, that's a little harsh. But when somebody starts acting a, in a meeting and starts getting loud and rowdy, I'm not afraid to be the one to say, if you don't like it, there's the door. Yeah. And a lot of times what will happen is I've seen people, I've seen people be like, you know what? I don't have to deal with this. And they'll walk out on their own. And like, cause they, they don't like that somebody else is stepping up and, and, and not afraid to speak, you know, and speak back. And of course we do this in a loving and compassionate way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, like, but we have to set our boundaries, and you know, and, and like, and, and we have, and we have to, we have to really work with the rest of the members of that house to show them that they have just as much as a voice. And, and again, bringing back when their own personal experience, like was just said, the members of the house, like my personal experience is just like that. I lived in a 12-person house. Four of us came to open that house. The four of us that went to open the house from other houses immediately started training the newcomers in the house in the different positions. And we were only there to fill positions when somebody else could not be there. And we trained. And that, that right there, what he had said, is, is so key to that. So. We got a full room. And thank you. I always tell people, I always tell uh, new members of houses, if you didn't come in with a voice, you're about to find it. <laughs> so uh, this is just like kind of along the same train of thought. Who are you? Where are you from? 
My name is Peter. I'm an alcoholic. I'm from Tacoma, Washington. Hey. I've lived in Oxford like three years, and I've been sober since 2014. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've also seen like the boss situation develop in like multiple houses, and uh, it's actually one of the reasons that caused me to get involved at the chapter level to begin with. Um, and get more involved because I was in a situation where I lived in a house where I felt uncomfortable both emotionally and physically uh, on a fairly regular, if not constant, basis. Um, because there were, was at least one uh, boss in my house with like a sidekick situation, basically. Um, and I recently got out of that situation because I just decided to open a new house. So I'm, I'm in a new house now, and I helped open that house. But the situation I was in still exists. And uh, I did approach my outreach worker, and I talked with her about what was going on. And there was multiple members of that house at that chapter meeting where we all spoke with the outreach worker. Uh, and it was decided upon at the time that she would come and attend the next house meeting at that house. However, she decided against it at the last minute, which may have been for the best in the end, because like the goal is not to create like a super uncomfortable situation for all the members present. However, when I lived at that house, I do recall seeing a piece of paper on the wall that said like the three things that an Oxford House can get shut down for, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, are if people are re relapsing and not getting kicked out, if people are not paying rent, and if the house is not being run democratically. And so these were the things that I brought to the attention of the outreach worker. And, and I'm not blaming her, and I'm not making any like negative comments here. I'm just like uh, expressing my observations on this situation. Because I think that this problem is much more complicated, like you were alluding to, than just like come to a house meeting as an outreach worker and hang out. Because um, I think, unless like, there, there is actual like chapter level intervention that can be made where like chapter officers or outreach workers come to the house. It's like when somebody has been in a house for five years and they're still acting like a narcissist and they're still running shit and being super unpleasant and making it uh, like a tangible um, air of uh, uncomfortability, which is in my opinion disruptive behavior, right? So that's disruptive to the to the. Uh, to the emotional stability of a house if there's members there who are like uh, running the show and everybody is feeling uncomfortable all the time. And I'm looking for actual solutions to this problem because like this is a problem that has existed in a house that I've lived in. It's a problem that I've seen observed um, in other houses in my chapter and other chapters in the local area. And every time I bring it up at state or anywhere with the outreach worker, there's kind of like just this talk and like mumblings and like basic suggestions, but I've never ever in my entire five years of sobriety seen an actual solution implemented to when a house is being run by several individuals. And I've never seen like a concrete action taken at a chapter level where there was like actual consequences or where people were removed from the house because, um, and I'm just wondering if there is actually a solution to this because from a philosophical perspective, and uh, accessing the spiritual toolkit that I have from working a 12-step program, you know, I understand that the only person that I can change is myself. Like, I can change my situation by removing myself from that situation. And that was the course of action that I found uh, most successful and um, most easily accessible, and it worked. And I feel much better in my new house, and I enjoy my leadership role where I lead the pack from behind. But um, I do believe firmly that there should be solutions um, and that situations like that where people are suffering from psychological or emotional abuse that like an actual solution can be found because it's not okay to have houses where people are like running the show because we are a team and we should work together and I am open to hearing any suggestions from anyone here which actually have like solutions that can be implemented not just conjecture. So, uh, So in case we didn't catch what the question was. Uh, the question was, <laughs> again, what is the solution uh, to this concept of bossism? Yeah. I will tell you in my area what I do. OK? 
because that's what I can give you is my experience. And in my area, the experience is I empower the new people. And what that looks like is I help you find your voice. And what that looks like is I teach. So I take the time to sit in on a house meeting. I take the time to teach you that what the democratic process really means. I take the time to show you that there's actually strength in numbers. So we all know it takes 80% to get into a house. We also know it takes 51% to get out. So if I have an eight person house and I have two people who seem to be taking the reins, I as an outreach worker take on the responsibility with housing services and chapter officers of empowering the other six people to understand that they have the ability to make decisions for their house that is for the benefit of their house. And for, I always remind people that it's not just about you in the house, it's about those yet to come. That you need to keep this running for those yet to come. And so it's getting the person who's maybe afraid to say something the first week to the second week saying, all in favor, and they say no. Just as something as simple as that. No, that I don't have, you don't have to explain your decision. No, <laughs> that no is a, is, is a sentence. <laughs> um, things like that for me are important. Um, it's very simple and, and I talked about this earlier that we want people to come in and just make the decisions for us, uh, but that's not the model. The model is the democratic procedure of those who are closest to the situation have the best way of handling the situation most of the time. Um, so that's my approach. I don't know about anybody else. Yeah. Hello, my name is Russ Hansborough. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, Russ. And my sobriety day is March 23rd, 2014. And I'm actually an alumni now, but my question is, because um, I've seen this go on a lot here recently, mm -hmm. so there's some guys and gals that are on Suboxone, and they're having a hard time getting into houses because other houses don't want to accept them because they're on Suboxone. And it is a legal way to stay off of heroin and to stay alive. So um, what can we do to, cause, to get people to overlook the fact that using Suboxone is not a way to get high, it's a way to stay alive, to be able to get them into houses? Because I've seen people get denied over and over and be looked upon and judged because they are on Suboxone. What is a good way to implement them to stay into houses? I'm not on it, but I know people that are, and it is very important to other people. So tomorrow morning <laughs> at 9:45 in Congressional Hall B, there is a panel specifically for Matt and Mar in Oxford houses and dealing with opioid overdoses. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for that information. Yep. But tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, I'm going to the airport and flying home for a wedding because I get to be part of something today Absolutely. with my family. Absolutely. That's great. But yep. I would like to have some information to discuss so I can tell others, please. So one of, one of the things that the, the people need to do is do research, right? They need to read about it. We as individuals are always going to have our own opinion right, of what somebody else is doing, but I never got a PhD. I'm pretty sure those residents don't have one either. So like they have no business telling someone they can't be on something, right? Um, and they really need to be open-minded to it, right? And it's, you know, medication is medication and, and like overtaking any medication is a relapse, right? right? And there's a difference between being 
like on a on a dose of a MAT and M MAR than you know somebody that's actually just using those off the street, yep. right? You, like if people are on a proper dose, you will never even know unless they tell you, and that's the way that it is. Is it be. a requirement to say that you are on meth are on uh, suboxone? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because yes, it, so the prescriptions can be counted. Right? They should be counted. Okay? They should be in a lockbox in your bedroom. Every state, so every state is going to be a little bit different because you can just go to a clinic for all of those medications every day. Not everybody gets take homes. Is a house allowed to say that they don't allow people on Suboxone in that house? Absolutely not. Okay. Thank you. Yes. They don't have to. So we're, we're done, right? Yeah. So I, I highly encourage, if you have any more questions regarding MAT and MAR, please go to the breakout tomorrow morning. Um, and, huh? Next question, please. <laughs> Tim, I'm an addict. Hey, Tim. I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. Woo! Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> I've lived in an Oxford house about 10 months, and I got uh, 13 months clean now. Yeah. Um, our area seems to struggle. We got about uh, eight houses in each chapter. They seem to struggle with getting people there, representing each house uh, monthly. So I was wondering if you guys had some suggestions, experience to get people to chapter meetings. So, so the first time a house doesn't show up to a chapter meeting, well, <laughs> no, but besides the fine, besides the fine, it's, we should be asking those questions in the chapter meeting of why they didn't show up and, and calling that to attention. Um, I, I'm sorry, but if a house doesn't show up to a chapter meeting and just throwing a fine at the house doesn't solve the problems, and that happens all the time in Oxford House. Um, the very next house meeting, the, uh, the first question I love to hear is, hey, does anybody know what time their house meeting is? When I hear that, I know, hey, man, there's a chapter officer in this meeting or a resident that's willing to go over to that house meeting. And, and uh, you know, when, and what I found is when you sit in a house's meeting, even if you don't say a word, even if you send the newest person in the room just to sit in their house meeting every week for a month, they'll show up. They don't want... Like, I, I don't know, I, uh, nobody wants somebody sitting in their house meeting week after week. Nobody wants uh, other people, outsiders, knowing their personal things and what goes on in their personal lives on a weekly basis, unless they're a resident of the house. So that's always my encouragement to uh, chapter officers and HSCs, show up to their house, and if you can't go, send them anybody, send your roommate. They don't have to say a word, just sit there, and they'll, they'll, they'll start to show up. Nice. I'm Rick and I'm an addict. Hey, Rick. I'm from Denver, Colorado. Yeah. I had nine months of sobriety. I've been in Oxford House for five of those months. Now, what I've noticed, you know, coming around, I, I've decided I'm going to stay. This is going to be a lifestyle that I decide to follow. It's one of my foundation pieces. Okay. Now, as we've had people come in and out of our house, it, it's more of a, you know, a guidance from you guys who are the elders. The, <laughs> Seasoned. Anyway, um, of, yeah. of taking away from the judgment of, you know, there, there are certain people who are going to walk into these houses and they're going to walk right out and, and they're, they're, they're identified quickly, you know, and is, is that a judgment on my part or, you know, is there something that I can do trying to grow in the Oxford House community? to relieve myself of that judgment, you know, to be able to help these guys or maybe even open their eyes that this could be a path that they could be on too, you know. This is my choice, and it's obviously their choice too, you know what I mean? So just some guidance in that direction. Anyone else? 
I can I, I'll say one thing towards it and the the judgment piece uh, we're all very judgmental people right uh, we try not to be uh, but the third tradition of the 12 step fellowships there's only one requirement for membership is a desire and we can't judge someone's desire right we need to give these people a chance, right? If they don't want to be there, they don't want to be there, right? Some people want to be there to get a court paper signed. Some people want to be there, but at the end of the day, it, it's a process. Just like recovery is a process, they might not want to be there the first week. We're going to make a choice come 30 days. This is where I want to be. So like practicing the traditions in all of our affairs, right is important and not just the oxford house traditions right. i told you i'm very big on 12 step fellowship <laughs> hi i'm a little shy um i'm so shy <laughs> hi i'm luna i'm from olympia washington <laughs> I've lived in Oxford for two years, and I've uh, been clean for two years and two months. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, so the question I was having, uh, we kind of talked about it in the women's conference yesterday, but it was sort of uh, uh, self-advocacy versus advocating for others. And I specifically am interested in maybe if you have any ideas about, you know, trauma sensitivity and triggers that can come up around various traumas like capital T traumas in Oxford houses and how to create safeties like as season, seasoned <laughs> members you know having uh, new folks come in that maybe are really close to traumas especially in women's houses um, really really close to traumas when things come up um, when there are triggers we trigger each other um, with PTSD like, how is it that we can, as season members, um, encourage those to advocate for themselves and communicating about these things, mm -hmm. um, but also be really sensitive about the personal information um, when we're seeing sort of this uh, lack of safety come, in, come up as we're learning how to respect each other's like PTSD and what works best for each other. I don't know if that question makes any sense, but I tried. Does everybody, <laughs> does, okay, so her question is in regards to um, allowing residents to find their voice, but specifically around uh, trauma-based events or, mm -hmm. or dealing with kind of aftermath situations. I'm, for myself, uh, having lived in multiple women's houses, this is a a big topic and I will tell you on a personal level it was a topic for me mm -hmm. um, moving into a house and having some PTSD as a result of childhood trauma um, and not knowing how to express that to the women that I lived with that my Nemo and Jack coming into the house all in three days in a row uh, probably wasn't the healthiest of behaviors um, and so for me, what it came down to was, um, just showing support sometimes. And I, and I think I said this in the women's conference yesterday, uh, in regards to a different topic, but it was simply being a listening ear sometimes is the best thing that you can do for an individual. Um, a lot of people who have trauma based events surrounding their circumstances never felt heard. So to feel heard by someone and not judged um, as best we can uh, is important. And I always uh, like to tell women who I interact with uh, specifically who might have an issue with something going on in the house but don't necessarily know how to approach the something going on in the house, um, depending on what it is, I may approach it. Um, until they learn to find their voice. Um, I, I don't have a problem being the advocate mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, and, and that's to show you that I once was on the other side of that 
and had needed someone to advocate for me. Um, so kind of just empowering them to slowly find it. it it's a process, man. Uh, this whole thing is a journey. And what I've, re what I've come to realize in my time with Oxford House is that you really need to take the opportunity to just meet people where they're at. Because everybody comes in different. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, Tim's got some. Real quick, my name is Timothy. I'm an addict. Hey, um, what I would like to say is that from, right from the onset, it's important to um, ask questions when doing the interview process. And so what that means on the other side, if someone is interviewing at the house, that I don't have to tell them my whole life story, but I can say, you know, uh, you're interviewing for the house. My name's Timothy, and I can perhaps help you identify with abandonment, trauma, and whatever else that I have personal experience with. And that lays the foundation for that person to feel comfortable to possibly move in the house and identify with someone there, whether it be trauma, abandonment, or whatever it is. I don't have to tell them my story, just what I have experience with. So we have uh, time for one more quick question. My name is Trinity. I'm from Owensboro, Kentucky. Hey. I got 11 months clean and lived in uh, Oxford for 10 months. Ah. Um, my question is a little bit of a touchy subject in Owensboro. Uh, we have multiple individuals that like to circulate through houses, relapse, owing money. <coughs> After the 30 days, they uh, come back. They put on a payment plan, basically, to the pay of the other houses that they've been and they infect the house again. Now, at what point does it become enabling for the houses to keep letting these people in? Is there a blacklist? Can we blackball individuals or can we, I mean, it's tough love. Eventually, it's my, it's my opinion and my theory that nobody's going to recover until they reach the amount of pain they need to get. All right. Anybody else? Anybody want it? I'm gonna let the boys take this. <laughs> so, so the the manual lays out that there's some different options here, right? First and foremost, if somebody leaves a house owing money, they need to make it right, okay? Like there, there's got to be some integrity behind that and some accountability. There are some options that are laid out. A house can choose not to accept somebody until they make the until they get caught up a house can accept somebody, set them up a payment plan where they receive the money and they pay the other house off. Um, a house can set up a, some kind of an arrangement with that other house. But the, the point is, is there has to be accountability. Um, the problem that we've seen that we've run into is where houses will accept somebody owing another house money or owing their own, you know, and they don't hold them accountable. Uh, it starts to interfere with the fifth tradition where each house is autonomous except for when it affects other houses or Oxford houses as a whole. When it's negatively affecting other houses, that's not, you know, that, that's in violation of our tradition. <coughs> um, I always recommend that somebody, if somebody leaves a house and they leave owing money to that house or they relapse out of that house or whatever, something didn't work for them in that house. So why would going back to that same environment be a solution for that individual? Um, you know, maybe look at a different house in a different situation um, for them, but you know, we have to have a level of accountability there. And we have to also remember that we are a community and we have to protect each other and take care of each other. Um, blacklisting, we don't ever, uh, we, we do not turn down interviews. We do not turn down interviews, okay? Um, we don't blacklist, but there's also other ways through communication platforms, email, uh, so, uh, that we can communicate with other houses and let everybody know when house money is owed. So, so I'm going to say this, and then we are finished. Um, in in my state, we do have a financial list of everybody that's owed money for the last two years, and it's over fifty thousand dollars, right? Um, what we have done is if a house wants to accept that person, that house needs to write a check for the money that they owe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay the house off, they can deal with the debt, right? And also, that person should be on new member contract, five meetings a week, no overnights until it's paid back. I told y'all he was one of my favorite people. <laughs> Thank you guys for attending. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.